You can continue eating. Just try to minimize the clanging. Josette mentioned that when you see the film just now, there's a lot of smiles. The reality, of course, is that 2019 was a pretty troublesome year for us in Hong Kong. And it reminds me of something. In 1989, that was really one reason why Asia Society was founded. In 1989, it was a troubled time. Well, Asia Society Hong Kong was founded. And previous to that, Josette's predecessor came to Hong Kong several times trying to start the Asia Society here, and nobody responded. But after 1989, Someone responded. The then chairman of HSBC, Willie Purvis, Lydia Dunn, Sir Joseph Hotong, and a few others, including our founding chairman, Sir Q.W. Lee. They thought that Hong Kong, as, as much as we can keep Hong Kong international, it will be better off for Hong Kong. And that's why the local community rose up to begin the Hong Kong Center of the Asia Society. Turn the clock forward, and there was another time, which was also a little troubling. And actually, it was not much after 1989. A lot of American companies, I don't know, uh, Council General <clears throat> Smith, if you know this, but a lot of American companies in 1989 was ready to leave Hong Kong. And an old friend of Hong Kong, the former Consul General of Hong Kong, Bert Levin, at that time the ambassador of the United States to uh, Myanmar, he came back to Hong Kong. He told all the American corporates at that time that China will be okay and Hong Kong will be okay. You will leave Hong Kong to your own disadvantage. And he managed to convince many American companies in those days to remain here. And it was his optimism that really helped many of those American and other Western corporates to decide to stay here. And Bert, what he did, a lot of people don't know this, but it was very, very important to Hong Kong. So today, in the spirit of Ambassador Bert Levin, Hong Kong is again in a little bit of a difficult time, perhaps the wisdom of Bert Levin should be remembered today. Personally, I believe that Hong Kong will be okay. I'm investing a lot of more money, not just in the mainland of China, and some of my Hang Long colleagues are here, they know. But if there's ever a time when people begin to not buy in Hong Kong, I think you will most likely see my company buying in Hong Kong because I remember what Bert said in 1990. Anyway, so we're delighted that when Bert retired from the Foreign Service uh, of the United States, he became the founding director of this organization and hence a predecessor of Alice Mong. And I was asked to join the board, I was asked to take over from Sir Q.W. Lee as the second chairman of this organization in Hong Kong in 1994 because Sir Q.W. Lee wanted to retire first and a year later Bert Levin would also retire back to the United States. So I worked with Bert very closely for that one year before he retired back to the United States. Upon his departure from Hong Kong, I decided to raise some money. Some people in this room probably supported us at that time in 1995 to set up the Ambassador Burton Levin Lecture Series. Every two years, we invite thought leaders from mostly America and the rest of and Asia to come and deliver a speech. So the first speaker was, anybody know who that was? President George H.W. Bush. Who was the second speaker? Former U.S. Secretary of State Jim, Jim Baker. Who was the third speaker? Former Defense Secretary of the United States Harold Brown. 
And I'm happy to say that, I, of course, I attended all of them. And later, we also have many other dignitaries, such as um, Princess Siriton of Thailand. Uh, we have uh, Professor Jonathan Spence, the Yale University uh, expert uh, on Qing Dynasty history of China. And we're delighted that today we should have another equally distinguished individual, my good friend, Professor Neil Ferguson. A number of years ago, I bumped into him, of all places, in Africa. For those of you who don't know, Neil has an African history in his very early days in life. And I bumped into him in, in, in Zimbabwe, and I said, Neil, interested in China? He said, yes, I'm very interested in China, but I'd like to learn more. So I gave him an idea. I said, Neil, why don't you go live there? for a while and learn about it yourself. Well, he said, I have a young son at that time, about one or two year old, Thomas. And so it is difficult for him and his family to move to mainland China. So in my moment of brilliance, and everyone is once in a great while allowed a moment of such. <laughs> and I said, why don't you move to Hong Kong then? I will help you set up. And uh, we have the president of a Chinese university here, Rocky. Uh, I said, I will go to Chinese University and see if I can get you a professor's uh, uh, housing. And you can put your family here with his lovely wife, Ayan, who also spoke for us, by the way, many years ago. In the absence of Neil, it was a better pro... No. Uh, <laughs> and then with the young son, Thomas, at that time, one or two year old, and came to Hong Kong and lived here for several months. And Neil would go into mainland China flying uh, to learn about China. A lot of people want to know about China, but very few people are willing to take the action to live here, whether mainland or Hong Kong, in order to seriously understand the country. And Neil was one of those very few. If today Hong Kong is a little bit of a trouble, having a little bit of a trouble time, I think the sympathy is that. The, what, that which makes us feel a little bit better is that the rest of the world is also in hell. <laughs> and for that reason, the only thing we can learn as far as I'm concerned about the possible future is to look into our past. So historians of all professors are perhaps the most important today. But many of these historians are so boring, I will never ever invite some of them to the A Society for fear that you will all relinquish your membership. <laughs> but there are also a few in every generation of historians who are truly brilliant. They see through a lot of things and they learn from history. Of course, you don't have to be a historian to do that. I think Dr. Henry Kissinger, for whom you are writing, Neil, the biography, He's certainly one of those. And, well, he was a professor, but not a historical, uh, history professor. Uh, Helmut Schmidt is another. Lee Kuan Yew is yet another. They are such people. But I think that historians in particular can really shed a lot of light to what the future may hold. And so in a troubled world, in a troubled Hong Kong, we are very, very honored and very, very delighted and pleased that Professor Neil Ferguson, one of the greatest thinker, historian of our day, should be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Professor Neil Ferguson. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, what a huge pleasure it is to be back in Hong Kong speaking for the Asia Society, thanks to Alice Thank you, Josette, for making this trip. I know you must have had other reasons for coming here. Thanks also for pointing out that my wife is a way more interesting person than me. <laughs> you know, Ronnie, uh, when I heard how much you were charging people to come and hear me speak, I was quite shocked, especially as I don't even get 1% of the takings. Ronnie... The original idea of Hong Kong was that Scottish people exploited Chinese people, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> what goes around comes around. I never knew Bert Levin, uh, but he was, uh, after his diplomatic career, 
amongst other things, a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where I'm now based. Uh, the Hoover Institution, by the way, uh, contains in its name the answer to an implicit question that Josette earlier posed to you when she observed that Kevin Rudd was the second Western leader uh, to speak fluent Chinese. Uh, the first was Herbert Hoover. Uh, and I'm honored to be a fellow at the Hoover Institution. I'm not sure everything I'm going to say will please Bert Levin if he is tuning in uh, from up above. Uh, but here goes. As an historian, I'm constantly asked about the future. And sometimes I think that's a little odd, given that that's not really our responsibility as historians. We do the past. But Winston Churchill once observed, the longer you can look back, the further you can look forward. And there is a profound truth in that. Indeed, increasingly I'm of the view that history is the best, perhaps the only guide that we have when it comes to thinking about the future. How did your economic models do over the past 10 years, folks? Uh, how accurate were those projections even of next year's GDP? How about those great political science models that so accurately didn't predict the result of the 2016 election. So it's not actually so daft to ask a historian about the future. The kind of questions that I get asked these days, I'll give you four, are will the younger generation keep on revolting? I'm looking at you. <laughs> because all over the world, not only in Hong Kong last year, we saw extraordinary protests, some of them violent, some of them vast in scale. These occurred not only in Hong Kong, they occurred in Santiago, Chile. They occurred in multiple cities uh, in Iran. They occurred in Baghdad. What these protests uh, had in common was very often the youth of the protesters. Is this going to keep happening? Should we expect that in the coming years? Will Trump get a second term? Pretty soon that will be the only topic of conversation in the United States. Are we, and this was one of the questions that you were asked in the opinion polling tonight, are we already in the opening phase of Cold War II? I was very struck by the fact that a majority of you Nearly all of you, 10 years or longer in Asia, think we're already in Cold War II. When I first made that argument in my column that I write for the London Sunday Times, I expected more pushback, particularly more pushback from China. And it's very remarkable to me that there's been almost none. I was discussing this with a a Chinese friend earlier today, uh, and he observed that the Chinese attitude was almost fatalistic, that the United States has kind of decided on this course that President Trump started this, and there's not much, really, that can be done to stop it. And then I get asked, what will this, this new decade be like? After all, we all habitually give decades characterization, the, the swinging 60s. Well, what will the 2020s be like? So these are the questions I'd like to reflect on very briefly uh, before Ronnie and I get into a heated argument that you then are invited to join. I'm not going to give a long and tedious lecture. You'll be relieved to hear. First, before I say any more, I want to remind you 
that when I was last here, which is really not that long ago, back in November, a lot of people asked, what's going to happen in the British election? And my answer was hopelessly wrong. I didn't say, oh, Boris Johnson's going to win a thumping majority of 80 and obliterate Jeremy Corbyn. No, I told a number of people in this room, I'm extremely worried. This looks like being very close. There's a nightmare scenario that it's a hung parliament and Jeremy Corbyn gets to form a minority government at which point people will be wishing they were in Hong Kong, not in London. <laughs> so I really couldn't have, been, I couldn't have been more wrong in being nervous about that election. And I'm, I'm telling you this uh, in the spirit of full disclosure. It's very difficult, no matter how much history you know, to get the future right. I love the fact that uncertainty was one of the words, or uncertain was one of the words that appeared in your word clouds uh, for both the United States and China. You're right. The future is uncertain. We live under conditions of radical uncertainty. Relatively little of the future can have a nice probability attached to it, like the probability that some people in this room will be involved in traffic accidents this year. Most of the stuff that lies ahead does belong in the domain of uncertainty. And it wasn't, in fact, a tremendous number of votes that determined that the outcome of the UK election was a landslide Tory victory because the first-past-the-post system has the consequence that a relatively small shift amongst working-class voters against Labour in a bunch of Northern and Midlands constituencies destroyed the Labour Party on December the 12th. Four years ago, almost exactly, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I was on a panel organized by Bloomberg with John Micklethwaite and Eric Cantor, and we were asked what chance Donald Trump had to become the next president of the United States. And I confidently said, and I remember these words with a, pay, a pained wince that he would disintegrate on impact as soon as the actual primaries began. I couldn't have been more wrong about that. So let me not deceive you. I am not Nostradamus and no one is. And be very, very wary of those people who claim, as some public intellectuals do, that they are always right and their predictions always come true. Normally, they're retrospective predictions of the sort that are framed, oh, I always foresaw the fall of the Soviet Union. Almost nobody foresaw that. Let me try and therefore stick to, to history, or at least let me stick to thinking historically. What I find myself doing more and more in my career is applying history. Considering a contemporary problem and thinking, well, what, what does this look like? What does it resemble? As I mentioned, the 1960s, we remember as swinging. The 1970s, we remember as stagflationary. In the 1980s, we made loads of money and greed was good. The 1990s were dot commy. The 2000s were the boom and bust decade. But how should we remember the last decade, the one that just ended? Will it go into the history books as the, the Trumpy 2010s or the Brexity 2010s in Britain? I was asked by the BBC over the Christmas holidays to come up with a, a name for the decade that had just Ended, and I thought that was a reasonable thing to ask. It's funny how these labels get attached to decades. I, I don't suppose most people in the world had a particularly swinging time in the 1960s. If you actually look at the world in the 1960s, only a tiny proportion of people were swinging. It, it was essentially the Rolling Stones. 
And everybody else was kind of trapped if they were lucky in the 1950s and if they were unlucky in something more like the 1850s. So there's a certain element of sleight of hand when we characterize decades. But let me, let me suggest to you that the last 10 years should be known semi-ironically as the people's decade in the sense of populism. Because it was a time when nationalism, particularly nationalism articulated by populist strongmen, generally got the better of the left. That was really the, the theme of the last 10 years. And it wasn't actually that surprising to an historian. I remember being interviewed by a Canadian newspaper in 2009, just as the financial crisis was at its deepest point. And they asked me to hazard a guess about what would come next. And I said, well, it's perfectly obvious that there will be a backlash against globalization, against the financial system, but that that backlash will be a backlash of the populist right, not of the left. If you're expecting the left to win from this, you're not reading history right. Because in many ways, what happened after the financial crisis was what's happened after every financial crisis since the 1870s. After the financial crisis, the left says, blame the greedy bankers. And some people are up for that. But the right says, no, 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 no. Blame free trade. Blame immigration. Blame the financial system. And that's a far more potent line of argument than let's lock up the bankers. Especially if you're addressing middle class people who very often in relative terms are the biggest losers in financial crisis. So let's think about the 2010s as yet another example of a financial crisis being followed by a period when the populists of the right, bashing free trade, bashing free migration, pushing for easy money, when the populists of the right make the gains. A lot of confusion arose in the period after the 2016 election because many people not having studied history confuse populism with fascism. The left was constantly trying to insist that some fascist moment had arrived in the United States when Donald Trump was elected. Tim Snyder at Yale published a book warning Americans uh, of the impending tyranny and giving them 20 tips on how to survive in a totalitarian state. This struck me as a completely mad category error to start looking in 1930s Europe for the key to what was happening in 2010s America. The populism of Donald Trump is a very familiar combination of policies that you can trace right back to the 1870s. The imposition of tariffs, the restriction of immigration, the pressure for easy money, that was the populist recipe of the late 19th century, not only in the United States, but in much of Europe. Remember, it was populists, proto-Trump figures in the 1870s who argued that immigration from China should be restricted, an argument that translated directly into the 1882 Exclusion Act. Populists should be taken literally as well as seriously. When Donald Trump on the campaign trail in 2015 and 2016 said that he intended to impose tariffs on Chinese imports, not only was it a powerful applause line, especially in Midwest America, it was something he intended to do. And yet people were staggered in Beijing and elsewhere in China when he went ahead and started to do it in 2018. What are the big themes of the 2010s? I'll give you four that I think explain why Trumpism and its variants 
Brexit in Britain, Bolsonaro in Brazil, there are a great many variants, why it has been so potent in the past 10 years. The first is that in the wake of the financial crisis, there was a kind of hangover, a hangover of relatively slow growth, the sluggish recovery that was such a conspicuous feature of the period immediately after 2008, 2009. There was, let's not forget, throughout that 10 year period, the recurrent threat of Islamic extremism, particularly uh, uh, in Europe, but also in North America, but most strikingly throughout the Muslim world itself, where Islamic extremist groups accounted for the overwhelming majority of terrorist attacks and terrorist victims. The third big trend of the last decade was the relative decline of the West compared with China. That really started to sink in after the financial crisis. Nobody had noticed in the boom period that followed China's accession to the World Trade Organization. When I first arrived in the United States and began teaching there in around 2002, I looked around and I asked my political science colleagues at NYU and at Harvard, where are the protectionist candidates in this country? And they looked at me a little strangely. I said, look, it's obvious to any outside eyes that manufacturing jobs are being wiped out by Chinese competition in this country. Where are the protectionist candidates? And the answer was that there were almost none. There was no articulate protectionist challenging China's competition with the United States until Trump announced his candidacy. I'll add one more trend to explain the 2010s, the people's decade, the big technology companies, the dominant and most successful corporations of the last decade, in particular uh, Facebook and Google, which between them transformed the public sphere, not only in the United States, but throughout the Western world, in fact, everywhere except in China. I don't think it's possible to imagine Donald Trump's election victory in 2016 without Facebook. I don't think one can really imagine him losing to Hillary Clinton if the technology of the election had been the same as, say, in 2008. In 2008, there was almost no role for Twitter or Facebook when John McCain took on Barack Obama. In the space of just eight years, as I argued in my most recent book, The Square and the Tower, available in all good bookstores and very reasonably priced on Amazon too, <laughs> the biggest transformation that occurred in that decade was a revolution in the public sphere as dramatic as the revolution brought about when the printing press in its modern form spread across Europe in the late 15th century. So if you think about those four things that I've just described to you, the sluggish post-crisis growth, the recurrent threat of Islamic extremism, the sudden realization that China was catching up, was indeed on the point of overtaking the United States, and this transformation of the public sphere by the big technology companies, you can see that in each case, the trend was away from the global and towards the national. And that, I think, was the decisive feature of the last decade. So, it's crystal ball time. What comes next? What will the 2020s bring? And will we look back on them and call them the Thunberg 20s? Or maybe just if, if Greta Thunberg turns out to be right, and Australia is reduced to ash, and Venice joins Atlantis beneath the waves, and Asia asphyxiate, maybe we'll just end up calling it the last decade. That's, of course, one of the characteristic features of our new decade. That a young generation, even younger in Greta Thunberg's case than the college generation represented at the table over there to my left, this new generation 
regards the world in a completely different way from the national conservatism that has attracted middle-aged and older voters in the 2010s. They're almost in a millenarian mood. The world is going to end in, in 12 years. There's a quality of, of accusation when Greta Thunberg addresses older generations that seems to me likely to characterize this new decade at some point. I've been doing a lot of work recently on generational division. It's not only a feature of Hong Kong life. One of the most striking features of American life today is the deep generational division on political issues. The difference in attitudes between Generation Z, that is the college age generation now, and the baby boomers and so-called silent generation or senior generation is extraordinary. Generation Z, the 20-somethings, say in the United States that they prefer socialism to capitalism, the only generation that that says that. On a whole range of issues, that 20-something generation is far to the left of the median voter. And that has very profound implications. If national conservatism, the kind of populism that Trump and others so successfully sold in the 2010s, primarily appeals, as it does, to older and less educated voters, that means that over the next 10 years, there must inevitably be a shift to the left. The increasing importance of the millennials and Generation Z and the swift, unfortunately, swift decline of the senior or silent generation voters means that we are almost bound to see the pendulum swing and swing quite far from the right to the left. The woke generation may be closer than it realizes to the great awakening that some people have foreseen emanating from the campuses, spreading in as it already is to the corporate world, and taking over the public sphere. Now, don't get ahead of yourself. I don't think this is going to happen in November this year. In fact, I think if the Democrats decide to nominate a progressive left-wing candidate, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, that candidate will lose as badly as Jeremy Corbyn lost to Boris Johnson. I think the shift from right to left will be something that happens in the middle or later part of the 2020s. In other words, from here until roughly the halfway mark, the 2020s will probably stay quite Trumpy and quite Brexity. On both sides of the Atlantic, I predict, the pendulum will start to swing leftwards in 2024. And by 2029, by which time I shall be 65 and Greta Thunberg 27, ouch, by then, this new decade will have found its epithet. Ladies and gentlemen, you may recall that the 1920s were known as the Roaring Twenties. Roaring it was a terrific time for flappers and jazz and gangsters and all the things that one recollects from black and white movies. The Roaring Twenties. But when you think about what Generation Greta stands for, maybe as the floodwaters rise and the cities disappear under sea, we'll call them the Rowing Twenties. I think the Rowing Twenties has quite a good ring to it, don't you? 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to come and, and speak to you tonight. Ronnie and I are now going to continue the conversation. We're going to have a heated argument about the Cold War, the United States, China, Greta, and whether the 20s will be roaring, rowing, or maybe just plain boring. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.